everyone and welcome to episode two of the House Detective Diaries. If you haven't watched the first one yet, I recommend checking that out. But basically what I do here is run through my top five most interesting or unexpected or fascinating stories from my house history research in the past couple of weeks. We'll be looking at where the suburb of Ashgrove gets its name from. Then I'll be talking a little bit about one of the oldest houses in the suburb of Ashgrove. Thirdly, I'm going to tell you a little story about how I basically accidentally got sent a photo of a house that I'm researching at Wavell Heights. Fourthly, I'll talk to you a little bit about the Workers' Dwelling Scheme, which was another government scheme similar to the War Services Home Scheme, which I discussed in the previous video. And finally, I'm going to tell you some very exciting news about a little exhibition I did a few years ago called Brisbane Retro, and it's all about post-war houses and architecture. So I hope you enjoy watching. All right, first interesting discovery for the last fortnight was where the suburb of Ashgrove gets its name from. So I was researching a house in Ashgrove, not surprisingly, uh, and I like to do a little bit of a background research on the suburb and the area and the subdivision of land down from huge holdings when it was first sold by the Queensland government, just to get a bit of a context for the house and the street. And as I was doing this, I noticed that a lot of the histories I could find online um, and a lot of records were saying that Ashgrove was named after a subdivision, a property a state development called the Grove Estate. But I had come across a flyer for this estate and it was dated 1888. And I, as I was looking through old newspapers, I saw that the name Ashgrove was in use well before this from around 1876. So I thought, well, that can't have given the suburb its name. It was already being called that before, well before this estate was being developed. So of course, because I can't help myself, I had to uh, do a little bit more research. So it turns out the first use I could find of Ashgrove uh, in the newspapers and in relation to an area of Brisbane was in 1867 and it was talking about the residence of George Rogers Harding who was a barrister and a judge in Brisbane. Now he has a property called Ashgrove and in the example I could find of him being listed there in the Queensland Post Office Directory, it's actually spelt hyphenated, so Ash-Grove. And this seemed to be the name of his house in what is now the suburb of Ashgrove. And they, he actually donated part of his land. He owned massive swathes of land around the area, hundreds of acres of, of land. That seems to be the first use of the, the name that I could find. And I think that what happened was he has put, purchased a whole heap of land in about 1868 and 1869. Prior to that, he was living on Wickham Terrace. And I think he's come out here and built himself a property and it's been called Ashgrove. And then in 1867, he nominates part of the land to be used for a local school and the school becomes called Ashgrove School. And I think that's what cements that name as the name of the district surrounding his property. And then a post office is opened in 1879. It's also called Ashgrove Post Office. He um, also early on in 1867, uh, he subdivides part of his land and that's known as the Ashgrove Estate. And it was quite common for uh, uh, residential subdivisions like that to eventually give their name to the surrounding area and sometimes become the name of the suburb. So I actually think that's where the suburb gets its name from rather from this Grove estate that was much later. Uh, but it was fascinating nonetheless and it just goes to show that you need to question everything and trust no one in historical research. So I mentioned George Rogers Harding as owning the property called Ashgrove in the previous segment. And he, after he lived at Ashgrove, he moved into a house called St. John's Wood. Now this is located, this was located and still is located, amazingly it still survives, in the suburb of Ashgrove. And it was built in, it was a house built in the mid 1860s for Daniel Roundtree Somerset. And 
George Harding moved in in about 1874 into this house. Now I was I was absolutely blown away when I was reading about it. I thought, oh, mid 1860s, it was built for sure. It's been demolished, but no, it's still there at Ashgrove. It's amazing. And what's really unusual about this house, apart from the fact that it's an early house that survives in Brisbane, is that it was built of granite, which is so unusual. I mean, as you would, most of you would know, it's a, it's a city of timber and tin houses in Brisbane and the small number of uh, masonry or stone houses that were built in the early days tended to be sandstone because it was available locally from Kangaroo Point Cliffs and other quarries, another one out near uh, Goodna. So to have a house built of granite in that time was very unusual. Um, and it was only quite a small house to start with when it was built by Somerset. But when Justice Harding took over, he expanded the house as well as adding substantial land to the, the grounds of the house. The house seems to have been known as St. John's Wood from the time it was built. So it eventually also gave its name to the surrounding area, just like Harding's previous property, Ashgrove. And it was a locale for many years known as St. John's Wood uh, before it became part of the suburb of Ashgrove. I've often had examples in my research where I really feel like the universe is looking after me with just unexpectedly stumbling across something that I needed for my research or someone coincidentally uh, mentioning something I've been looking into and knowing about it, that type of thing. And what happened this week was, some of you will have seen it, I posted a video of me after I spent the whole day in the State Library of Queensland searching for photos and information on a house at Wavell Heights and I found absolutely nothing despite looking through newspaper clippings, old photo files, uh, microfiche. And a guy I know purely through Facebook and I've chatted with him quite a few times on Messenger and so forth, he uh, saw my video and saw how disappointed I was and he sent me a photo of his grandparents' house uh, on Rody Road at Wavell Heights just because he thought I might be interesting, interested in seeing it because it shows in the background the lack of development in Ashgrove even in 1928 when the photo was taken and he thought I might just be generally interested in it. So he sends it through. I loaded up this morning on Messenger and I'm thinking, that looks like the house I'm researching in the background of that photo. And I'm thinking, surely not, because it's quite a common style. But I, had, I looked into it and I looked up the address of where he told me his grandparents' house was. And I'm thinking, it has to be, like in, the, in where it's situated in the back of this photo, it has to be the house I'm looking at. And I had looked at the 1936 aerial and I knew that there was very few other houses around by that day. And sure enough, when I looked at the aerial again, there's the house on Rody Road, that's uh, Neil's grandparents' house. And there's the house I'm looking at in the background and it's got a few sheds along the back fence, which you can see in this photo. So thanks to Neil, who unexpectedly sent me a photo of the house I'm researching, which I've been looking for a photo of for quite some time. And he had no idea when he sent it through how happy it would make me. So thanks, Neil. In last fortnight's video, I chatted about the War Service Home Scheme, which was a government social housing scheme designed to provide affordable housing for returned servicemen or their, or their female dependent family members. And this week I'm going to talk about another government scheme that actually predates that one, which is the Workers' Dwellings Scheme. Now this was a Queensland government scheme introduced in 1909. So the Workers' Dwellings Scheme was again about providing affordable housing, but it was targeting people on lower incomes rather than returned servicemen. So to qualify for a loan from the Workers Dwellings Board, you had to earn less than 200 pounds a year and you also had to not already own a home anywhere. And they did this basically by requiring a much lower deposit for purchasing a home than say banks or building societies. And the interest rates were also much 
much lower than you would find at a bank or building society so the repayments were much lower and also like the ward service homes it the one one of the ways they kept the cost down of these homes was they offered a set of standard designs that applicants would choose from so they were only building a certain number of styles of homes and so forth and the house that i was researching was the one at wavell heights and I was looking into that and as soon as I looked at the house I thought that's that's one of the very common workers dwelling board style homes and uh, although they were affordable they were incredibly well built they were all built out of hardwood and they were by no means austere or anything like that they could be very large and in fact, if you wanted a more expensive home or if you wanted custom elements introduced into the standard design, you could pay extra and arrange to have that done. The scheme proved to be incredibly successful and very popular and thousands of these homes were built throughout the Brisbane suburbs and also all through Queensland. And the scheme was so successful that it eventually became what the, the Workers' Dwelling Board eventually became the State Advances Corporation, which offered similar affordable loans and housing. And that eventually became the Queensland Housing Commission. So effectively, the scheme went on for decades and decades under different guises and with different conditions and standards and changing house styles. So it really is quite a remarkable scheme and of incredible significance in the history of architecture in Queensland. All right, so the final thing I want to discuss this week is something I'm very excited about. Way back in 2015, I was lucky enough to receive the Lord Mayor's Helen Taylor Research Award for a project that I undertook called the Brisbane Retro Project. And this project was completely designed around wanting to capture houses from the post-war period, so from 1940s to 1970s, wanting to find examples of houses that were still basically as they were when they were built, so that it had very few changes. And what I wanted to do, because they were, so many of them are being knocked down so quickly now, as you all would be aware, I wanted to capture uh, photographs and record these places before they were gone. And I wanted to capture them how they looked when they were built before they were altered so that we had a good collection of evidence showing what the houses were like when they were built in their particular time period. What was popular? What did the kitchens look like? What did the bathrooms look like? What materials were being used? How was the, the internal floor plan changing over that time? And yeah, it was a fantastic project. I um, held an exhibition at the end of it, which was so popular. I thought no one was going to turn up and I was so worried about it. And it ended up that my husband had to jump behind the bar to help out where we hosted it because they were so busy. They, they couldn't handle all the people that were there. So I was so thrilled and it made me feel so great because I thought I was the only one that cared about these post-war homes. I thought everyone only liked the old Queenslanders and I very rapidly found out that that was not the case, which made me very happy indeed. And it was so wonderful to meet so many homeowners that absolutely loved and valued these homes from that period as well. And it was just the best project, one of the best things I've ever done and one of the things I'm most proud about in my career as well. But anyway, I digress. Um, but that's a bit of background about the, uh, the project. But the exciting news is that the State Library of Queensland actually acquired all the photos and my research from that project and it's now available live on the State Library of Queensland website. So I will put the link below in the description for this video, but you can jump online now and you can look at all the photos I took of all these great old houses. I think there was 21 or 22 houses in total from memory across Brisbane, all different styles, all different time periods, all different context, different suburbs. Um, and now all those photos and the brief history I did of each house is online as well as the exhibition posters that I did for the exhibition which were sort of based on different themes with a bit of background information on each each type of house and that that sort of thing so I'm absolutely thrilled I use the State Library collection all the time for my research and to have something of mine in their collection I just I, I absolutely can't believe it it's it's really blown my mind and I just find it so exciting now that 
these photos and these houses have been captured for posterity and in a hundred years if a historian wants to know what a house from the 1960s looked like and they've all been knocked down by then uh, they can jump on and have a look at this and they'll know exactly what uh, certain examples looked like. It's all captured now and anyone can jump online and look at it from anywhere in the world which oh my gosh it just I've, I've I'm so thrilled. I can't can't even tell you how thrilled I am. But those of you who took part in the Brisbane Retro Project will know how obsessed I am about that era of housing and how passionate I am about um, at least capturing some evidence of it before they're all gone. So yes, very excited little house detective when I found out that news. Well, that brings us to the end of this fortnight's House Detective Diaries. I hope you've enjoyed watching. Let me know in the comments below what your favourite story was, if you've got any stories to add about Ashgrove or anything else I've discussed. I'd love to hear from you. And also, if you want to keep up with my House Detective adventures, you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram and TikTok. And I regularly post things that I've been up to during the week as I undertake my detective work. <laughs> All right, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.